Uh, let, me, let me remember a little story. I once participated in a debate much like this, but it was in Ireland. It was at University College Dublin. And I was taking the cab from Shannon Airport to the hotel, and the cab driver wanted to know why I was there. So I said, well, I'm going to disprove the existence of God, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and he says, uh, I have a theory about that. You should always listen to your cab drivers. They have good uh, things to say. So the cab driver, because in Ireland, it used to be 20 years ago, 30 years ago, one of the most staunchly Catholic countries in all of Europe. Today, Ireland is largely secular. And my cab driver says his theory was that it was because the church lost its moral authority. A series of scandals and hypocrisy and repressiveness and pageantry over true devotion had led the Irish people. It's not because Darwin showed how species evolved or because Stephen Hawking calculated the wave function of the universe, that's not what people want from religion. And when the moral authority goes away, it's going to be up to science and naturalistic worldview to develop a, a model, an understanding, a, a set of answers for how we should live our lives in this world. And we haven't done that yet. The good thing about a debate like this is that we're attacking tough questions. The bad thing is it's delaying us from attacking the even more important questions of how to live productive human lives in a world governed by the laws of physics. And uh, I, I need to put it in words that are better than mine. So there's a quote from Anne Vuyen, Carl Sagan's wife, that was floating around Facebook. After Carl Sagan died, his, uh, Anne was asked, did he have a deathbed conversion? Did he start believing in an afterlife because he was close to death? And she says, Carl faced his death with unflagging courage and never sought refuge in illusion. The tragedy was that we knew we would never see each other again. I don't expect to be reunited with Carl. But the great thing is that when we were together for nearly 20 years, we lived with a vivid appreci appreciation of how brief and precious life is. The way he treated me and the way I treated him, the way we took care of each other and our family while he lived, that is so much more important than the idea I will see him someday. I don't ever think I will see Carl again, but I saw him. We saw each other. We found each other in the cosmos, and that was wonderful. Thank you. Well, uh, this can be really heady stuff. You're making it quite simple. You've been on Nova, the Colbert Report. You're popular on social media for making this uh, really accessible. But why should just the average person care about the Big Bang Theory, the universe, or the arrow of time? You know, when we're six years old, we all care about this stuff, right? Kids know that the universe is an interesting, fascinating, exciting place, and they ask questions. Why is it like that? And so I'm not saying that we should invent some new passion for understanding the universe. We should just remember that we do care about it. It's kind of beaten out of us when we go through high school and get jobs and things like that. I think that everyone should share in the passion of figuring out how stuff works. Well, speaking of high school, when it comes to teaching physics, many people would kind of yawn and say, well, this was terribly boring. Uh, do you think that physics in high school or science in high school should be taught differently? And if so, how? I think it should be. I'm not a, a, a real expert, and I have great respect for the teachers who do a good job, but I think there should be a lot more emphasis on the method of science, the way that we figure things out, rather than just on the facts that we get at the answers. I think that in the modern technological era, we can be able to use the internet and video games and all sorts of wonderful ways to teach people the puzzle-solving skills that make them think like scientists. Why is it important for us to think like scientists? Well, we live in a world that's governed by science, right? Uh, not only the physical world that obeys the laws of nature, but our social world, you know, our human world is extremely influenced by science now. It is the best lens we have with which to view how the world works. And I think that everyone should play a part in figuring that out. I agree with that because I particularly like it. Now, tonight you're giving a lecture at the Reuben H. Fleet uh, Science Center. How are audiences, how do they actually typically respond to your uh, lectures and to these conversations? Well, there are audiences that came to hear me, so it's a selected group, but they love it. You know, I think that there's no reason why, even if you're not a professional scientist, you can't follow along with what science is doing. I think that I want to live in a world where after work, people get off a long day at work, they go to the bar, they have a drink, and they talk about their favorite interpretation of quantum mechanics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And the third point, which I think I could tie into this question, but it actually was inspired by uh, Hans's first answer to the first question. He said, uh, with, with a certain facetious air, you wouldn't expect to open up the Bible and, and see it tell you that part elementary particles are representations of the gauge symmetry groups. And I would like to know, why shouldn't I expect that? Uh, in a more general feature, if I do believe 
that the Bible or some other sacred religious text is telling me anything true and non-trivial about the world, something that we have gotten from religious experience or revelation or direct contact with the deity or whatever it is, if there's something that we get that we could not have gotten by ordinary scientific explanation, why in the world didn't God tell us some useful scientific facts? I would claim that the only reason we don't expect to find useful scientific facts in religious texts is because we don't find useful scientific facts in religious texts. We, you might say, well, God didn't, we didn't have the vocabulary 2,000 years ago to be told that elementary particles were in representations of the gauge groups. I would claim that God could have done it. He's God. God could write the world's most awesome textbook. He could have explained these things even a long time ago. And even if he chose not to, he could have said, you know what? The universe is billions of years old. He could have said, we're made of atoms. He could have said many, many true but non-trivial things at the time, and he didn't, never did. There's no religious tradition that really comes out and says remarkably true, interesting, non-trivial scientific facts long before science found them. And I think that if we're judging the two models, the two ontologies of theism versus naturalism, and saying, what would we expect to be true under these two views of the world? If we didn't know the actual history of religious texts, I would have guessed that they would have told us something interesting and, and non-trivial about the natural world. Therefore, the fact that they don't, I count as evidence against that point of view. You can't know that by logic, and it looks like, um, and I think you agree with this, you can't know that empirically also. That you're not going to find a transfinite number somewhere. So it looks like you either have to believe that we have ways of knowing that are not empirical and not logical, or you have to say, we actually have no good reason to believe math. Okay, interesting question. We have no good reason to believe math, because, <laughs> uh, because what math is about is starting from assumptions and then deriving conclusions. But these assumptions may or may not entail in the real world. If, if a, a possible universe is a point and nothing else, and then in that universe, it's still true that 1 plus 1 equals 2, but there aren't two things in that universe. So math is always subjunctive. If these things are true, then these things would follow. Sir, Dr. Carroll, if you grant that the study of the nature of the universe can be undertaken with at least similar critical rigor in both natural, naturalism and theism alike, what is gained by pursuing such an endeavor with naturalistic presuppositions rather than theistic presuppositions? Well, I think that it's not a presupposition. I don't think it should be a presupposition. I think that naturalism is the conclusion we reach by empirical investigation and trying to understand what is the best framework in which to understand the universe that we see, given the data we have. Uh, as data get better and better, one's best fit model changes over time, which is why I'm happy to say that 500 years ago, the best fit model was theism. But now we know better, given you know advances in physics, in biology, in cosmology, naturalism is the conclusion of thinking about what empirical information tells you about the universe. If you did go in with a presupposition, I would agree that would be a mistake. As an atheist, do you feel your beliefs are superior to other faiths? We could probably spend an hour on this, so we're going to try to keep it short. <laughs> I know Sean has something I'll take to say a shot about at this. <laughs> yes, uh, I do believe that the things I believe to be true are more likely to be true than the things I believe not to be true. In fact, I suspect everybody believes that. I don't, I, it is weird that atheists get this accusation that you think what you believe is true. How can you do that? And I think that if, if people didn't believe what they thought was true, they would have different sets of beliefs. <laughs> so I think that the beliefs I have, I try to get to by combinations of reason and evidence. And I think that everyone should do that. And the great thing about scientifically based beliefs is you're willing to update them if better evidence or better logic comes along. So I think that you know, the beliefs I currently have are the ones that I think are most likely to be true, but I'm happy to change them if you give me a good reason. I once read a, uh, an amazing article by a woman, I'm, I'm sorry I forget her name, I wish I could quote her name, but she was for a long time a major player in the New Age movement and sort of mysticism and Age of Aquarius type stuff. And one of the reasons why she uh, felt that that was the right place to be was because she thought that scientists were arrogant, that they had all these answers to questions they didn't have any right to have answers to. But with her New Age friends, she would sometimes raise questions about their beliefs. And she noticed a pattern emerging 
talking to her new age friends versus talking to scientists, that scientists would sometimes say they didn't know the answer to something, and that her new age friends would never say that. They had an answer for everything. And she realized, actually, science does claim to know the answer to some things. But there are other things that it very quickly admits it doesn't know the answer to. Dinesh just gave you a list, a laundry list of things. Where did the universe come from? Why is there any universe? Is there life after death? And he says, and science has no clue about any of these things. As if that's a bad thing. <laughs> Scientists are extremely proud of the fact that we know we know some things, and we know there are other things we don't know. We know where the dividing line is between what we know and what we don't know because of good reason. For why there is a universe rather than not, we don't know the answer to that. Is there life after death? We know the answer to that. Why? Because we know what we're made of. We know how it acts. We know there is nothing to keep any sort of soul alive after the body dies. And that goes back to Ian's discussion of how does science know some things? Is science the only way of knowing things? Science is clearly not the only way of knowing things. There are other ways of truth. For example, mathematical truths are outside of science. They are logical truths, not empirical ones. But it would be a mistake to think that religion is a different way of obtaining truth that is outside everything else. In fact, religious people have exactly the same epistemic, epistemic standards as non-religious people do, except when they're talking about religion. They would, Ian didn't actually give you a reason to believe that God exists. He just said that it's outside the realm of science to talk about it. But then when he really wanted to make a point, he said, you know, I, I believe in miracles, for example, I've seen them. Data, experimental evidence is ultimately what matters. Does science make assumptions as it doesn't need to make? One of the arguments against science from uh, the religious side of things is that science assumes from the start there is no supernatural realm or there's perfect regularity among the laws of nature, but that's simply not true. A scientist, if they were faced with something that was manifestly supernatural or a deviation from the regularities we observed in nature, we would try to understand that. We would not say, I, I just can't deal with that. I don't know what to do. We would <laughs> approach it using the methods of science. The only assumption that science makes is that the world is not trying to trick us, that we are not a brain in a bat being taunted by a mad scientist, that we can more or less trust our sensory data, and we look for patterns in that data. Could there be miracles? Of course there could be. But you're faced with two worldviews, one of which that says that those eyewitness testimonies that D Dinesh mentions of people who are regressing to past lives are mistaken. The other worldview says that all of the laws of physics that we think we know are wrong. And that's the choice you need to make. And the decision that we make is based on the same criteria we would always make. And imagine, let's just, let's just imagine that people who believed in God took that hypothesis, that idea, if you don't want to call it a theory or hypothesis, that's okay, that idea, just as seriously as scientists took their theories. What they would do is try to be skeptical about it. Can we disprove this? Can we use it to make a prediction and compare that to the data? And a lot of people talk about the problem of evil. My favorite problem is the problem of instructions. I am personally a textbook author. I have read Amazon.com reviews of my textbooks. But if I were God, my textbook would be perfect. If God existed, the one thing that if there, it were, there were an omnipotent being that cared about us here on Earth, I would expect clear instructions. I would expect a book that I knew exactly what it said. It was clear that it was right, and I would be able to follow it. If God did not exist, I would expect all sorts of different books. They would contradict each other. Some of them would be brilliant in parts. They would be silly in other parts. They would be uplifting in parts. They would be uh, very depressing in other parts. They would be edited collections. They would be personal memoirs. They would all disagree with each other. Which of these two theories fits the data? Thank you. <laughs>